reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Along the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter said to him in reply, You are the Christ. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and rise after three days. He spoke this openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. At this he turned around and looking at his disciples rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. He summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel, will say the gospel of the Lord. Amen. People of God, thank you for holding down the fort over the last couple of weeks as I took some R&R. &R. By the way, our message and a word today, stability, a message in a word today, stability. A disciple is one who bears the cross, and a way in which we bear the cross is through stability. But I'll unpack that for you in a moment. So two weekends ago, I was with my folks celebrating their 68th wedding anniversary, and then on the day after Labor Day, I made my way up Highway 1. Highway 1 is open, and uh, made my way up to about a mile south of Santa Lucia, and then I went up the, uh, the mountainside uh, to spend four days in a monastery to spend time with the Moldavites, uh, which is uh, part of the Benedictine family, and uh, just wanted to enter into their life for four days. So part of my own spiritual journey is there was a number of years ago I connected with the Benedictines. And uh, we have a monastery locally here, and that's in Oceanside, Prince of Peace. Many of our ladies from Lyft uh, go there annually for their retreat. And we also have the Benedictines in the high desert, Valierno. And uh, um, so many years ago, I would go down to Prince of Peace on a regular basis because I was discerning, you know, whether to be a diocesan priest or a monk. And uh, obviously, I, uh, it's, it's obvious what I, what I ended up choosing, but I was very drawn to their life. And I made the distinction between attraction and vocation. So even though I'm drawn to their life, uh, I don't feel called to them. But what I like about their life is um, the order, the order of the day, the balance of the day, from work to prayer to rest to uh, community life together. There's a rhythm to the day, and they're not under the tyranny of the urgent. And a monk lives off the bell, huh? So every time the bell rings, and it begins at 5.15 a.m. in the morning, and I would join the monks at 5.30 for prayer uh, a.m. Uh, the bell reminds the monk that his life is not his own, but rather he belongs to a community. And as a community, they do their life together. So even though they might be engaged in a particular activity, and it might be really uh, uh, a 
very good engagement. It might be where a monk's passion lies. When he hears that bell, he drops everything. Well, we live, we live off the bell too, right? 2 a.m. feeding, <laughs> cough medicine to the bedroom, call from an elderly parent, call from a son or daughter, you know, at work. Uh, uh, we hear, oh, by the way, I need you to do. Okay, so we live off of that. And every time we uh, hear the bell in our life, it's a reminder to us that our life is not our own, but we belong to family. Uh, whether that family is a parish family, our own immediate family, our work family, uh, our friend family, that we belong to others. Now, the monks make four vows. And I forgot the fourth one until I uh, reconnected with them a couple weeks ago. So they all promise obedience. Poverty, meaning we live as a community, everything is shared. Chastity, but the fourth, and in many ways, maybe the most important, stability. Stability. Benedict, the founder of Western monasticism in the 6th century, said that if you want to be a member of my community, there is no back door. Okay? There is no option. There is no escape route. He, if you are going to be a member of my community, you make the vow of stability. In other words, you stay put, and you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You work out your salvation with us. Because the issue that Benedict faced in the 6th century is the same issue that we face in the 21st century. Monks were known to go from community to community. So they go into a community, and after a couple of weeks, once the honeymoon was over, and they were working side by side with another monk who somehow irritated them, they said, I don't want to be a part of this community, and I'm gone. I'm out of here. And oftentimes in the world in which we live in, people are always looking for the escape route. They're always looking for uh, at options. They always see the grass is greener elsewhere. And uh, once things get difficult and challenging, they move on, they leave. But Benedict established stability because it, it, he clearly understood that a person's holiness, that their sanctification, that their growth in discipleship, came from staying together and working together as a community. That my salvation and sanctification is wrapped up and tied into this community, and their salvation and sanctifi uh, sanctification is tied up with me. That we all need each other. Where do we learn love? Where do we learn patience? Where do we learn how to get along? Where do we learn tolerance? Where do we learn self-restraint? Uh, where, uh, where do we learn uh, respect and uh, acceptance of various viewpoints and differences? By staying put and working it out together. And that we will never grow in maturity. We will never be the disciples that the Lord is calling us. If with every challenge, we decide to head for the hills. We need to save them. And that was the gift that Benedict brought to his community. Well, think about it. You don't leave a marriage, you work it out. You go to a therapist if you need to go to a therapist. You work it out. We're in this together. Somehow we have to find a way. And, uh, or you have uh, a person with disability in your family. Why? You don't head for the hills. I'm leaving my family because we have uh, a challenge. Life isn't easy. It's not convenient. No. We stay together. We work it out. We find a way. Just because our parents uh, uh, need our constant attention and care doesn't mean that we head for the hills because it's, it's tough. And inconvenient and not easy. We stay together. We work it out together.
because we need to ask ourselves the question, uh, because oftentimes when things get tough, we begin to think about, well, maybe I need to move on. Do we ever ask ourselves the question, Lord, Lord, what are you asking of me? Uh, Lord, how do you want me to grow in this situation? What is it that you need from me? Uh, where do I need to surrender? Because when we live life in family, when we live life in community, our own foibles, our own self-absorption, our own immaturity is revealed to us. And that is an opportunity for us to say, okay, Lord, I'm staying put because this is where you have called me. And uh, this is where you are inviting me to grow to grow in maturity, to grow in my faith. You know, every year at the seminary, uh, we were always evaluated, so I get called in, okay? And well, uh, Tim, we're, we're concerned about your anger issues. Anger issues? I have no anger issues. <laughs> what are you talking about? Okay, but that's what community does, that when you're in community, all of a sudden, if you take a real honest look yourself, you see yourself in the mirror, and you go, I need to grow up. And I grow up by staying put and working it out with this group of people that God has placed in my life. Now I have, I'm going to be honest with you, I've been a priest for 36 years, and I've been on the precipice of leaving a number of times. Okay? A number of times. Then I catch my breath, and I look out onto the assembly, and I go, there are people who are fighting to keep their marriages alive. There are people who are uh, uh, going to 12-step support group meetings to, to keep their sanity. They're not leaving. They're not escaping. They're not moving on. They're facing their reality. And by facing their reality, they're growing in spiritual maturity. And so I would catch my breath and say, no, I'm staying put. I'm staying put. This is what uh, God has called me to be a priest. Okay? And um, uh, so, so stability. Stability. We bear the cross, huh? And the cross will bear us. The cross will bear us in a way that uh, a disciple is one who bears the cross. And we stay put is a way that we can bear the cross. For couples, right? For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, and sickness in the county. To stay put. Stability, that's how we grow. So five years ago, uh, after my heart surgery, the diocese called me in, concerned about my health and my heart. And they were, you know, they were thinking of my good, and they thought that perhaps they might put me in a less stressful situation. Is there such a thing? <laughs> Is there such a thing? Okay. And they said, we have a parish for you, bought and paid for and $4 million in the bank. Okay. And I said, no. I didn't even bat an eye. I was a year and a half here at Corpus Christi. I said, I was appointed to Corpus Christi. This is where I'm supposed to be. I was sent here. This is my family. I don't leave because of stress. Who doesn't have stress? You don't leave your family because you have stress. You know, you don't leave your family because of financial concerns. This is family. We'll work it out together. And my maturity, my spiritual maturity, uh, is dependent upon me staying and working out my salvation with fear and trembling with the people of God here at Corpus Christi. And I'm going to see my term through. And at the end of my six-year term, I serve at the pleasure of the bishop. If he wants to move me on, then so be it. But I'm committed. And well, he extended it. Yay. Okay? <laughs> but the point, you know, nothing is easy. Don't know marriage is Family is easy, nothing is convenient. It is hard work to stay put. To stay put. And I'm here to affirm you. 
I'm a priest today because of you, because of your stability. And given the darkness of our church right now, here you are. You haven't left. You're here. You know others who have left, and we don't want to judge them, not at all. But you're, you're, you're staying. You haven't left. Because this is family. And as a family, we're going to get through this very dark moment in our church. And there are things that are going on that I don't understand. There are, I, don't, uh, I don't have access to the back room where things are discussed. Uh, the men who wear pointed hats need to do their job. I don't know what's going on in the world, but I know that I'm here. And I know that you are here. And you are the good people. And the one thing that the church needs now, perhaps more than ever, is it needs good people to stay. You know, and sometimes it's darkest before the dawn. Darkest before the dawn. But I believe that a new church is being birthed. We're going to be a part of that new church. And I do believe 100 years from now, 150 years from now, the faithful will look back upon this age and be very grateful to us because we stayed. We didn't leave our family. Angry? Absolutely. Outraged? Absolutely. Betrayed? Absolutely. And this is our family. We don't need our family. And so it's really important, I'm just asking you, to stay the course. Creativity, like human life, begins in darkness. It is darkest before the dawn. Christ is birthing a new church. He's purging it and birthing it. It's my opinion. And please, just stay the course. And all of us together stand in the course. And I make an apology to you because I know that it might be rather hard if somebody says, you're Catholic? And then all of a sudden it's like, uh, all of a sudden it's like, well now I've got to defend, explain, and rationalize why I'm Catholic and what I'm saying. And you've been put in awkward positions. And I apologize that you are, have been placed in an awkward position. And I'm just asking you, Stability. We bear the cross, and the cross bears us. And a way that we bear the cross is to I'm about ready to land it, and I'm going to a quote. This quote comes from St. Augustine, because I really want to talk about the anger. We'll talk a little bit about the anger. I get it. And anger has its time and its place. Okay? We don't want to move too quickly out of anger. Sometimes we need to stay there for has its season. We don't want to get stuck there forever and ever. But if we're angry, we need to be angry and not to be afraid of anger. But what I propose to you is what St. Augustine said. Anger is a sign of hope. If we didn't care, we wouldn't be angry. We care deeply. That's why we hurt people. But this is what Augustine said. Hope. One of the three theological virtues Faith, hope, and charity. This is what he said about hope. And remember, it was St. Francis who said, where there is despair, may we bring hope. Okay? So it's not a time for us to despair. Hope has two beautiful daughters. Two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger and courage. So your anger is a sign of the theological virtue. Well, think of mad. Huh? Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. Okay? That organization came together because mothers were outraged at the loss of their sons and daughters. Okay? But they decided to do something about that. So anger is a sign of hope. So, their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are, certainly. Here's the key. And courage to see that they do not remain the way they are. And that is what our church needs the most right now is courage. 
do what is absolutely necessary. So let's pray for our family. Let's pray together. Let's pray for our leaders. And uh, and let's let's stay put because that's where we learn how to be disciples, where we grow in maturity. It's how we learn to love, to forgive, to be patient, to be respectful. So let us now stand and confess our faith. And together we say.